Welcome to episode one of Beef Brothers. Uh, this video will be on YouTube and in podcast format on your listening app of choice. Let's say good day to the duo collectively known as the iconic Beef Brothers. We've got 1989 NBA champion and 18 year veteran Rick Mahorn and 1982 all rookie first teamer and a two time NBA all star Jeff Ruland. How are you this evening, gentlemen? Great to be here. Thank I'm glad to be here, but you could have left Jeff out of this doggone show. <laughs> he insisted on being here. See what a big bully you are on this this video. You oh, realize. shut up! Just shut <laughs> up. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, my name is Adam. Uh, if my accent didn't already give it away, I live in Australia. I've followed the NBA since 1989 when I was 13 years old. Uh, I host an NBA podcast called In All Airness. It's devoted to the history of basketball. Uh, particularly the 1980s and 1990s, uh, but we'll get into all kinds of topics. Uh, just for the benefit of our viewers and listeners today, episodes will begin with a discussion of the, today's NBA. Uh, we'll cover some of the latest news and hear Rick's and Jeff's opinions, and then we'll turn back the clock as they reminisce about some of their experiences and life in basketball back in their playing days. I hope to ask them today about the first time they met We'll examine the origins of their nicknames, and if we have time at the end, I might even give them a quick quiz on some Australian slang, see how they uh, go with knowing which words or phrases I'm talking about. Based on my research, before we chatted today, it's August of 1979, and you are both in Colorado Springs, and per some newspaper reports, I read that you were two of the 32 basketball players hoping to earn a spot on Team USA for the World University Games in Mexico City. I can see Rick smiling already. Uh, what do you recall of those tryouts? And was that actually the first time that you guys met? Well, we that met was... in practice. <laughs> I remember the hot tub drinking Coors Light with the U.S. volleyball team and volleyball. <laughs> I was the only small school there. I was the only... Hampton Institute. I wound up rooming with Cal for the whole month. Well, that's after they cut me because Bobby Bobby Knight looked at, looked at the roster and said, Ham, Hampton Institute, what the hell is that? And it was like I was leading – I was rebounding my butt off in there. I was some Division Two guy that was the head coach. But I remember uh, – Ken Anderson? Yes, yes. Training camp. I played really well, but for some reason, all of a sudden, I don't know what it was, the altitude or something, my Achilles was starting to bother me. And they were actually going to – they were going to cut me if uh, if I didn't practice the one day. Wanted to practice, and we won the gold. Matter of fact, I gave that medal to uh, Jim Balvano, and I'm actually just spoke to Pam. If she still has it and doesn't want it, I'd like to get it back. Oh boy, now you want you want your you want your stuff no, back. I think it was huh? my grandmother, your grand, yeah. grandmother. Oh, right? I, I want to. You want I'm me to rub you? Unfortunately, I got into a pretty all star thing, which I would yeah, trade well, in a yeah. heartbeat. Uh, yeah, oh, the little, oh, the little, oh. The, you want your look? Can I get my medal, please? That's a like hundred years ago. Oh, so, I wish I could elbow you through the screen. I really, yeah, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Bring back some of the Beef Brothers, you know, Adam. Our, our friendship, uh, it goes back to, yeah, we both were out there. It wasn't like an AAU where you, you see you're playing against somebody every day. This was, you know, it was a friendship because. He was a real genuine person, and and that's why we're friends till this day, forty plus years of just knowing this guy. And then when I got traded, he was more upset when I got traded. He called me to tell me I got traded. I was sitting there wow. all like, he, he said those motherfuckers traded you, and I was like, huh? I was sleeping my. And I'm like, right, okay, I wait, wait, Detroit. And I said, all right, but. Our friendship never left, but and we also got on the court and we competed. It was like, yeah, fuck you, we're going at each other. But it was also after the game, let's go, let's go get something to eat, have a good time. No question, my friend. Uh, many, many people are like you. I, I wish you would have, back in the day, got the credit that you deserve as like defensive player of the year. This guy could guard uh, one through five. They talk about it now. It's pretty funny. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, what, <laughs> one heat guard, Mark guy one night, Dr. J, the next, Kareem, Moses, you name it. Thank you, we, sir. 
we should have won a lot more games. Right. And the teams were a little stacked, you know. Everybody, uh, either you were played for the Celtics, the Lakers, or the Sixers, and they had five or six Hall of Famers. And the two dudes with the shirts. <laughs> the referees were also uh, <laughs> part of that, were they? Seven against five every night. When we would get on that court, Adam, it was a thing of beauty because it was like we would hit so hard you can i'm gonna hit him harder than you bam and next thing i'm gonna hit him harder than you bam and it's like boy this was fun i mean it got to the point we were setting picks so hard that they didn't even want to you know even follow the guards sometimes it made it easier for guards to get layups and and things like that because their bigs weren't that tough at that time so calling out the screens and then they'd be mad they said, you should be mad at your teammate for not calling the screens out that's, yep. that's, that's his fault. Shit. I look forward Different. to delving into your basketball history and talking a lot more about the Washington Bullets and your years in the 1980s together. Uh, I believe that the Beef Brothers nickname was actually given to you by Cedric Maxwell during the 1982 playoffs. He might have dubbed you that after one of the playoff games. Does that sound right? Or who actually originated that nickname? We had a couple of nicknames. McNasty and McFilthy. Johnny. That was the first one, Johnny Most. And... He would tell Ruling. I'll let Ruling tell you that story with, with well, John Moe. Brothers, there was a guy with the beef sign in the thing. He had like a, a USDA beef thing, and it said Beef Brothers. That's when I first saw it. But I don't remember uh, Cedric. I don't know. He's not sharp enough to do beef. <laughs> and don't talk about my man Brad. Brad's still uh, cool. Uh, Johnny Moe's story is my mom used to listen like Rick's mom. My mom was on Long Island. She listened to the game on the car radio until I could get her a, a satellite dish. And she's like, you know, I understand the whole Homer thing. She goes, that guy, Johnny Most, uh, he just, it's a little fucking too much <laughs> with the home in this shit. I said, all right, Ma, I got you. So we're warming up, and I see him sitting over there. i not in his normal seat, and I, I go, hey, Johnny, I got a message for you. My mother thinks you really suck. <laughs> uh, start the game. Johnny's like, Mrs. Rowan, her name was Swanson and be at that time, but said, Mrs. Rowan, if you're listening, please turn your radio off. <laughs> every every time we played, it was funny <laughs> as hell. But he was like, Oh my gosh, that's so dirty. Ah, he, nasty. He, he spit him out. He hit him with a baseball bat. Mm, <laughs> that Mahorn, they need to go to jail. <laughs> while you're jumping in the air and stamping on your feet. Yeah, but oh, that was get up to about 140 degrees, and the roaches and the rats are running around there playing cards. <laughs> that fucking dead spots on the floor. That place was a shithole. They had three showers. One worked. <laughs> One squirted out little sprinkles of water, and if man Boston, and then when we and I know we'll be talking more about it, but when I play with the Pistons, it, we would come in there because we were getting better. They would do things to try to disrupt uh, disrupt you mentally. I guess it was mental warfare. It was like they would break a window when it was like 20 degrees outside, but the shreds of glass were never inside. They were outside. So they were breaking the window inside <laughs> in order for it to get cold. And we sitting there going like, that's some backwards ass shit. <laughs> It's so it's so petty for me. It would fuel me. That's why I never had a bad game in that fucking dump. I was so pissed <laughs> off about the heat or the showers or the shit treatment. Red, you got you got to admire guys. He he, yeah, he played you know it. Help. <laughs> yeah, they 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 really loved it. The fans really they would call your hotel room hours of the night. You just have to put the block you you know do not disturb in your hotel room. Pull oh, fire you. alarms. They were bad. Their fans were just bad. And the people are inviting me home for dinner. The people were great. Boston fans, most of them. Well, I'm white, so who knows? Yeah, I'm going to leave that one alone. Boston does have a reputation, unfortunately, for better or worse. Uh, just in relation to the arenas, you mentioned Boston Garden there, probably not one of your favorite venues, but what were some of the favorite places that you enjoyed playing in during your careers? For me... I used to love that teams would boo me and my home team would cheer me. Back then, out of the 22 teams, 21 of them would boo me, and I would love it because if I was on their team, they would be cheering for me. So that was my 
my uh, psychological warfare for them. So the more they booed, the more that encouraged me. I knew they loved me. So my favorite was probably going to Boston because I get a chance to see my family. And what about you, Jeff? First and foremost was the reason I went to Iona was to Madison Square Garden. The second was San Antonio. I remember in the old, wherever the hell they played, the Atmosphere. Alamo. Uh, whatever. Uh, Alamo Dome? No, it, was the, it wasn't the Alamo Dome. It was the hem Hemisphere. Oh, Hemisphere yeah. Arena. Yeah. Yeah. The lady looked like my mom, and she cussed me out. She called me every fucking name in the book. I just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> so uh, San Antonio fun place the baseline bums yeah it was oh, i looked up i looked like anita i'm like anita she's like you motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> well you know what you gotta love fans because when whenever i hear philadelphia like they're booing the joel and bead and harden and all of them the fans there they just want to win they don't give a damn they don't give a fuck yeah they, yeah. they want you to put out they they want you because you're getting paid an absorbent amount of money. If you don't, if you ain't running in the stands and going after loose balls or doing what you need to do, one thing about Philadelphia fans, I've seen them fight Santa Claus. I don't give a <laughs> hey, no, no, man. Whenever I, I felt so bad because I couldn't play for them when I was hurt, but I was watching my first year there. They beat the shit out of the Redskin guy. They put him in the hospital. They stomped him, man. I hey. Mean, hey. They call it the city of love, the brotherly love. I was like, yeah, they're going to give a brother some love if they come in there with some bullshit. Dude up, man. I don't think that dude ever recovered. Crazy. But you know what? Fans make this game fun when they when they act accordingly. You remember you know? we used to in the Boston Garden and guys would say stuff and we just throw the Gatorade or... Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, my, my best one, and I know... We got to go around get to another one. My best one, it was this guy at Market Square Arena in Indiana. And I always see he would be on the he would be under the basket and yelling and making. I said, You look like you need some new shoes. You paid all that money for that seat. You need to buy some <laughs> shoes. And then I told him he started his his wife was sitting next to him. I said, You kiss your wife with that mouth. And he looked at me, fuck you. And I said, No, nah, just tell your wife. <laughs> <laughs> mad as hell i said you just don't know me because i got jokes too <laughs> if i can ask one thing about some australian slang a word or a phrase any idea what it could mean i'll tell you right now i don't know any of them but i'm willing to learn go ahead how about this one there's a phrase that we use in australia that's called budgie smugglers do you have any idea what you'd be wearing tight pants you got it rick you got it yeah budgies are uh, it's like um for speedos do you have speedos over there like the male swimming trunks hey hey ruler still wears speedos <laughs> well there you go and, and jockey draws okay thank you just quickly that thank was you very it much. yeah okay, that's it mate. okay mate thank you, you very much mate on. uh just quickly to, we'd, we'd love interaction with the show in future episodes you can ask rick or jeff questions about their careers we'd love to hear from you uh if you're yep. watching on youtube please ask a question or add a comment below podcast listeners can also send an email perhaps just email myself it's in all anus at gmail.com just one word in all anus at gmail.com i can collate the submissions for the future shows uh and you can also reach out on instagram uh, rick is rick mahorn 44 official uh jeff is ruland jeff so thanks very much for your time today, guys. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to chatting again soon. And until next time, uh, enjoy your week. One more thing, Adam. Just sure. knock on my door before you leave. Stop lying that you're in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. You're getting ready to do something He's in else. Brooklyn right now getting ready to go have a beer. <laughs> He's down the street. All right. See y'all. Okay, right. Jeff. Thank you, guys. Peace. Bye.